Welcome to this week's episode of Reading the Gospels Through Hebrew Eyes. We have a fun and a challenging section of Luke 17 to look at for this coming Sunday. It's fun because there are some Jewish parallels in relatively contemporary literature to what Jesus teaches here about discipleship, especially the Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs, as well as the Pirkei Avot, these sayings of rabbis that's recorded in the Mishnah. So we've taken a look at those, as well as Leviticus, and what it has to teach us about rebuking a brother who has sinned against us. But, so that's kind of the fun part. The challenging part is seeing how all of these verses kind of connect one to another. So Luke 17, 1 through 10 has really about four different sections to it. So we'll just kind of look really quickly at what is coming up, and then we'll take each of these sections bit by bit. So verses 1 and 2 talks about how it's better to die by being drowned than to be the cause of sin for one of the little ones of Christ. And then we shift in 3 and 4 to if a fellow believer sins against us over and over, and comes to us in repentance, then we must forgive him over and over. Verses 5 and 6 is a response to what the disciples say about increasing their faith. And Jesus teaches us that it's not about the quantity of faith, because even a tiny faith does great things. And then we conclude at the end with this parable unique to Luke about not expecting heaven to throw us a parade for simply doing our duty. Service is not heroism. So that's what we got coming up. Uh, Let's jump into these first couple of verses And then we will uh, go from there to the rest of these sections. So Luke 17, 1 and 2 introduces us to the idea of stumbling blocks or snares. Jesus said to his disciples, Temptations to sin are sure to come, but woe to the one through whom they come. The reason that I have put but in bold is because that's not the typical adversative in Greek. It's plain is the Greek word that's used there. And this is a very strong adversative, so we might highlight it or underline it. So temptations are sure to come, nevertheless, but woe to that one through whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were cast into the sea than that he should cause one of these little ones to sin. On the picture, you see a uh, representative millstone. Millstones were sometimes small enough to be used by hand. Sometimes they were so big that they had to be pulled by and, and a beast of burden like a donkey, round and round. These, the millstones would have rested on top of a foundational stone. And of course, this was the way in which grain was, was ground. So, first of all, notice that this is not the only place in the Gospels where this kind of language is used. So in Mark 9, 42, and in Matthew 18, 5, and 6, we have somewhat parallels to this, especially the Mark 9, 42 is basically teaching the same thing there. Matthew's a little bit different. In Matthew, the context of these little ones is referring to a child. So whoever receives one such child in my name receives me, but whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, then we have the millstone language that's being used there. So who these little ones are that are caused to sin kind of depends upon the gospel that you're looking at and the context in which it is said. I don't think that Luke is necessarily talking here about children, but little ones in general, meaning the the followers of Jesus, the children of our Heavenly Father, we might say. So what does this actually mean, this causing to sin or being a stumbling block? Well, let's take a look at the Greek. So we have actually two different forms of the root that's, that, that's used here. The, we first of all have the noun. So a scandalon, of course, we get our word scandal or scandalous or perhaps scandalize from this, uh, from this word. So the noun is scandalon, and that's the noun used in the beginning of Jesus' speech where he says temptations to sin. So a scandalon. But then when you get to the end, when he says he should cause one of these little ones to sin, that's the verbal form, scandalizo, which I have rendered there as scandalizing, to scandalize someone, cause someone to sin. Now, what's helpful is understanding how this word in Greek is also used in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament. So I have some examples there of how it's used. First of all, uh, the image on the right shows in the New Testament the various ways that it's been translated as a hindrance, a stumbling block, obstacle, uh, a temptation, an offense, a sin. All those are attempts in English to capture this one Greek noun, skandalon. Now, in Hebrew, that is often used to translate mikshol and mokesh, two Hebrew words. And 
It's used in all sorts of different ways in the Old Testament. I mean, it's used kind of almost liter- literally or metaphorically as a snare to trap something or someone, but I'll, and also with stumbling blocks. Like it's used to not put a stumbling block in front of a blind person, causing them to fall. So it's used in that sort of way, but it's also used in kind of a broader way that fits with what Jesus is saying in the sense of a, a scandalon can be a cause of ruin or an occasion of misfortune, an obstacle, an occasion of of sin. It's used in all those sorts of ways in the in the Septuagint, and that then comes over into the New Testament, where it is used multiple times, also in this kind of broad sort of way. So if you are scandalizing someone, now don't read your English into that, like maybe sometimes it would be a scandal, but that's 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 not exactly what the Greek means here. You don't have to be, you don't have to cause a scandal in order to be a scandalon in Greek to someone else. What it's talking about is in some way acting, speaking, being the kind of person who is going to cause one of the little ones in Christ to to trip up, to to fall. And most of the time that what is implied here is 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 something that's a, a very serious offense. So if you are a scandalon, this is an, an an extremely dangerous situation for you to place yourself in because you have now placed someone else in an extremely dangerous situation, being a scandalon. So much so that Jesus is saying, you know what? It's better for you to die a premature death, to have a millstone hung around your neck and drown in the depths of the sea. That would be better for you than for you to end up being a scandalon to someone. So some some very heavy law that's being used here to warn the disciples of Jesus against participating in the evil forces of darkness in this world and becoming a scandalon to the little ones of Christ. Those things are going to happen. There's always going to be a scandalon in the world, multiple of these, but don't, as a disciple, become one of those. It'd be better for you to die than for you to become that. Okay? Now, Let's go to the next section and see what Jesus teaches us about uh, forgiving others. So this is verses 3 and 4. Pay attention to yourselves. Now, there's some debate, by the way, as to whether this phrase in Greek is concluding what we just talked about with the whole scandalon language. So pay attention to yourselves and don't become that. So is this phrase concluding that first section or is it introducing this section that we're taking a look at? Who knows? Maybe it's kind of a bridge between these two, but commentators will go on both sides of that that question. But either way, Jesus says, be aware, pay attention to yourselves, be cognizant of yourself. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in the day and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. Now, I've color-coded the verbs that are used there because I want you to notice what's missing in the second section. So in the first one, you have sins, rebuke, repents, forgive. In the second section, you have sins, repent, forgive. Jesus does not repeat the rebuke word in the second part of this. And I think one implication of that, I don't want to read too much into that, but one implication of that is that his accent is not upon the necessity of continually rebuking someone, but the necessity in discipleship of forgiving your brother over and over if that is necessary. Now, let's talk about uh, something that's extremely easy to miss. And I didn't find anyone in the commentaries that I consulted that, 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 that pointed this out, but I think it's worthy of our mentioning anyway. So Jesus says, if he turns to you seven times. The Greek verb used there is epistrepho. Now, when you go back to the Septuagint and you look at how this verb is used, and it occurs a bunch of times, over 500 times, most of the time epistrepho is used to translate the Hebrew verb shuv, which is the verb for turn, return, or repent. So most of the time in the Old Testament, when you repent, you turn, you return. Now, epistrepho carries the connotation of either turning away from God, of course, in apostasy, or turning to God in repentance. Now, the reason I point this out is because Jesus seems to be saying, if he turns to you and says, I repent, already implied in the use of that verb, if he turns to you or returns to you, is an indication that he is repenting. It's almost, uh, it's almost repeating himself. So Jesus is saying, if he repents to you and says, I repent, if he turns to you and says, I repent, then forgive him. Now, the Old Testament background here is helpful. Uh, we'll take a look at where this comes from in Leviticus and also how the Septuagint language is, is going to help us to understand the connection here to Leviticus. 
So in Leviticus 19, 17, and 18, this is the well-known section where we have the, the other great command in the law, to forget to love your neighbor. But it begins this way. This is Leviticus 19, 17. And this is the ESV translation of the Hebrew. You shall not hate your brother in your heart, but you shall reason frankly, the Hebrew verb yakach, you shall reason frankly with your neighbor, lest you incur sin against him. So don't be, don't be harboring hatred in your heart, but yakach, so reason frankly with your neighbor so that you don't incur sin because of him. And then it goes on, of course, to talk about not bearing a, a grudge or, or having taking vengeance, but instead loving your neighbor, okay? Now look across to the Septuagint translation. You will not hate your brother in your thoughts, so kind of a parallel there to the Hebrew, except it says thoughts instead of heart. Firmly reprove your neighbor. The verb in the Greek verb used there is elegko, and you will not incur guilt. And then it goes on, of course, to say the same thing. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now look at this. If you go to Matthew 18, 15, where Jesus is talking about how you deal with someone who sins against you, he says, if your brother sins against you, go and elegko, tell him his fault. That's the same Greek verb that's used in Leviticus 19 for firmly reprove your neighbor. And Matthew 18, 15, this going and telling him his fault is, of course, a parallel thought to what we read here in Luke 17. Pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. It's epitemao in Luke, but kind of a parallel of language there. The main point I want to make is that when Jesus says to rebu rebuke or reprove your neighbor, what he's talking about here is, is nothing new. Leviticus has already talked about this. This is already rooted in the Torah itself. And it's, in the, it's so important. Notice the context. The goal is not rebuking your neighbor. The goal is forgiving your neighbor, loving your neighbor. And part of that is to reprove him, to, to talk to him about this sin which he has committed against you so then that he can repent and that you can forgive him. Also, there's a, there's a beautiful parallel to this, this idea of loving and forgiving in, the, in one part of what's called the Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs. Uh, this is, this is usually dated to around the end of the second century BC. So this is before the New Testament is written. There's admittedly some later Christian interpolations in some of the sections of this, but it's broadly dated to the end of the second century BC. So this is from part of it. This is the Testament of Gad, chapter six. Love one another from the heart, therefore. And if anyone sins against you, speak to him in peace. I love this, this image here. Expel the venom of hatred and do not harbor deceit in your heart. If anyone confesses and repents, forgive him. But even if he is devoid of shame and persist in his wickedness, forgive him from the heart and leave vengeance to God. By the way, I, I've had this for, for many years. This is part of a two-volume uh, Old Testament pseudepigrapher. picker. That's where you can read about the Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs. It's tons of wonderful Jewish literature that's included in, in those two volumes. Now, the reason I like to read from the Testament of Gad in this respect is because it, it shows that what, G, what was said in Leviticus and what Jesus says is also being echoed in some of this popular Jewish literature of the day. Now, also notice that Jesus is talking about the necessity of forgiving your brother over and over. When he says seven, it's not as if Jesus expects us to count to seven. And when, you know, if a brother sins against us eight times, we're like, oh, too bad. You know, you, you've reached the limit. As we read elsewhere in the New Testament, you know, if, if he sins against you 70 times seven, you continue to forgive your neighbor. And also, the focus here is upon repeated absolutions. The focus is not upon how he must repent before you forgive him. That's a whole side issue. What is being talked about here is if your neighbor, if your neighbor sins against you, comes over and over and over and requests forgiveness from you, then you forgive. Because we are living in imitation of our Heavenly Father, who forgives us over and over and over. So, Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us, whether it's 70 times or 70 times 7. All right, next section. This is 5 and 6. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. I've often wondered if the reason they have this exclamation is because they're, they're imagining trying to forgive someone who sinned against them over and over and over. And they're like, well, I don't know if we have enough faith for that. So increase our faith, Lord. Well, he says to them, 
If you had faith like a grain of mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. By the way, if you, uh, if you look at the Greek here, it's kind of an unusual Greek construction. Uh, Robert Stein and his Luke commentary suggests that it's best translated as, if you have faith, and you do, you could, and then go on and say to that mulberry tree. So Jesus is not, in other words, saying they don't have faith. He's admitting that they do, but in this conditional statement, it's phrased in such a way that's a little bit different in Greek so as to kind of soften that. So if you have faith, and admittedly you do, then you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted. By the way, the idea of a, of, of a grain of mustard seed, as you're probably all familiar, that's a, it's a proverbial saying. We have that elsewhere in the gospel. So if you look at Luke chapter 13, Jesus is telling a parable about the kingdom of God, and he says, what's the kingdom of God like? And he says, well, what? It's like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his garden, and it grew and became a tree, and the birds of the air made nests in its branches. It's proverbial, of course, because a grain of mustard seed is one of the very smallest grains that you could, have, that you could see that you would have there in Israel. Now, the point that Jesus seems to be making here is by, is by hyperbole. The disciples are saying, as it were, we need more faith. We need, we need a greater amount of faith to be able to do what you're talking about, Jesus. And Jesus turns things around, and he says, oh, no, you don't. Uh, it doesn't matter. It is, we're not counting faith. We're not saying, you know, you have a thimble full, you have a, a barrel full. That's not the point. He's saying faith is faith, basically. And if you have faith as tiny as that mustard seed, well, then you can do great things. It's, it's a hyperbole. Of course, there's not talking about throwing an actual tree into the sea, because why would you do that? Matthew says, uh, in Matthew's version, he talks about having a mountain thrown into, thrown into the heart of the sea. The point is that Jesus is saying, listen, it's not about greatness or smallness of faith. It's simply about if you have faith. That is, if you are connected by me to the Father, if you are my follower, if you have faith in me as the Messiah, then God is going to do great things through you. And he uses this uh, memorable example of the tree being thrown into the heart of the sea. That is simply all that is being communicated there. Okay, last section. We get to the parable that is unique to the Gospel of Luke about humble service. So let's read verses 7 through 10. Will any of you who has a servant plowing or keeping sheep say to him when he's come in from the field, come at once and recline at table? Well, of course, the expected response to that is, of course not. No. Will he not rather say to him, prepare supper for me and dress properly and serve me while I eat and drink and afterward you will eat and drink? Does he thank the servant because he did what was commanded? So you also, when you have done all that you were commanded, say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. Let's first of all deal with this word unworthy, which I think some translations render as useless. So the Greek there is akreos. And yeah, it's sometimes rendered as useless, sometimes as, as unworthy. I kind of like the way that the NET has translated this. I think it kind of captures what is being implied here. So you too, when you've done everything you were commanded to do, should say, we are slaves, and that is a good translation of that Greek noun, by the way, slaves rather than servants. We are slaves, undeserving of special praise. We've only done what was our duty. Now, I think to understand this, we can use a modern example that fits, if not perfectly, almost perfectly with the communication of the parable itself. So let's say that my wife and I go to a restaurant on a Friday evening. Well, we're not going to walk into the restaurant and then say to the server, I tell you what, before you do anything for us, we want you to sit at a table by yourself and then and have your meal, take your time, have your, you know, have your meal, and then, and then after you're done, then uh, you can take care of us. Well, of course, that's not the way things work. That's not the way things work in the world of service, just like they didn't work that way in the world of service in the first century. No, we expect for our server or the host to seat us, to take our order, to bring us our food, to refill our drinks, to do all these things. To, we, pay, we pay for it. We leave. It's cleaned up. Then and only then does the server take his or her break and have his or her meal. That's just the way it works in the restaurant business. That's the way it worked in the first century world as well. So I think even our, our modern the way that we live today basically is exactly the same as it would have been in the first century. When the, when the servant comes in from the field, this is probably a, 
you know, a small family because the servant in the field who's taking care of the, the, the plowing or the shepherding also is a, a servant inside. Of course, this servant is going to, first of all, serve on his or her master before that servant can take care of himself or, or herself. But, <laughs> but isn't it fascinating that you have both things communicated in different parts of Luke about sometimes you have a master who is served, but also you have a story about the master who's serving his servants. So take a look at Luke chapter 12, verse 37. Blessed are those servants whom the master finds awake when he comes, Jesus says. Truly I say to you, he, that is the master, will dress himself for service and have them recline at table and he will come and serve them. So we serve a serving Lord. So you got, you got kind of both of these truths that are communicated in different parts of, of Luke's gospel. On the one hand, he's saying, hey, don't expect heaven to stand up and give you an ovation every time that you simply do what is required of you. So that's not heroic service. Simply doing your duty, living faithfully, is what is required of you. So you don't deserve any kind of special thanks for that. That's not a heroic effort on your part. But at the same time, you have that message communicated, which is really about humility. You also have this great hope of what's going to happen when the master returns, where he, who didn't come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many, will serve us. He's going to have us recline at table, and our Lord is going to serve us because we serve a serving Lord. Now, I want to wrap up by comparing and contrasting two different images of, of perspectives when it comes to serving God. One from the Pirkei Avot, which is a, a collection of kind of rabbinic wise sayings. They are written down in the Mishnah, which was collected around 200 AD. These Pirkei Avot are kind of proverbial sayings. We'll look at a couple of those, and then we'll contrast this attitude with a parable that Jesus tells. So uh, if you look in uh, a Pirkei Avot 1.3, we read, Be not like slaves that minister to the master for the sake of receiving a bounty. So don't be that kind of servant. Don't be thinking that you're going to receive a bounty for your service. And also Pirkei Avot 2.8, If you have wrought much in the law, then don't claim merit for yourself because it was for this end that you were created. So if you're laboring in the law, if you're laboring in the Torah and you're learning it, well, don't think that that's somehow going to get merit for you. You're just you're doing the very thing for which you were created. So both of those are accenting this, this humble service in the Torah, humble service of God. Now, contrast that. With, this is Jewish literature. Contrast that with the parable that Jesus tells in Luke 18, a very, very well-known parable about the Pharisee and the tax collector. These two guys who go up to the temple to pray. Well, what does the Pharisee say? Well, he stands by himself and he prays, of course, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. And then he goes on to, of course, brag about his piety. He fasts twice a week, he gives tithes of all he gets, so on and so forth. So notice how both in this Jewish letter to the Pirkei Avot and in the parable that Jesus tells, we have a contrast of different perspectives, one of which is humble service and one of which is prideful service that expects God to give us some sort of merit because of, because of what we have done. So that's the four sections that we, uh, that we have in Luke 17, 1 through 10. Let's see if we can maybe pull all of these together. So if we did, summarizing it would be something like this. Don't be someone who causes others to sin but be ready and willing to rebuke others in a spirit of gentleness. Rebuke them who sin against you, that they may repent and be forgiven. This is an expression of love for your neighbor. And don't worry about how much faith you have. God will use your faith to do what he wishes. Keep your mind on service. Being faithful, fulfilling your vocations in humility. This is what the life of discipleship looks like. So that's Luke 17, 1 through 10. Uh, this, there's not a ton of grace and mercy and gospel in this, in this section, and that's not unusual. You have sections like that in other parts of, in other parts of the gospels. But you do have a, a, a clear accent upon various facets of discipleship. And of course, in the broader context of the gospel, what does this discipleship look like? Well, it looks like dying and rising with Jesus. It looks like becoming his follower by being united to him so that his life is yours and his forgiveness is granted to you. 
and the work of the Spirit within you is what brings about this life of discipleship. So that's Luke 17, 1 through 10. Hopefully, uh, this walk through it has proven helpful as looking at it from Leviticus and Pirkei Avot and other parts of the, uh, the popular Jewish literature of the day. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you next week.